Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the annual financial support from viewers like you by the Travelers Insurance Companies. Over 30 million Americans benefit from our insurance, financial services, and managed health care. The Travelers Insurance Companies. By MFS. MFS helping mutual fund and institutional investors achieve their financial goals since 1924. And by Prudential Securities. With more than 5,600 financial advisors nationwide, Prudential Securities can help you invest your money wisely. Produced Friday, April 29. Our panelists are Alan Bond, Frank Cappiello, and John Dessauer. Tonight's special guest is Fred Grauer, Chairman, Wells Fargo NICO Investment Advisors. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Well, this was the week when Americans learned a harsh and troubling fact. What they say in Washington ain't always so. I hope this news is not too upsetting to you. Because out there in the real world, where people vote with their own money, three of the most cherished ideas of recent years, from the supposedly best minds in our government, got taken to the cleaners. There was nothing partisan about it. The discredited ideas came from both sides of the aisle and were repudiated with total impartiality. First was the somewhat weird idea first promulgated by deep Republican thinkers nine years ago, that the best way to strengthen a nation's economy is to weaken the nation's currency. It was a fascinating, if dubious, notion when Jim Baker first sold it to Ronald Reagan. For if that had been truly a viable idea, the strongest economies in Western Europe since World War II would have been Britain's and Italy's. The weakest would have been Germany's and Switzerland's. And the strongest economy on the face of the earth today would be that of Brazil. And so this week, with the drive down the dollar policy so successful that the greenback fell to near its post-war low against the Japanese yen, world markets trashed American bonds so severely that Treasury Secretary Lloyd Benson had to rush in to swear it wasn't so, and that we would now be seeking a better way to reduce our trade deficit. But if the first repudiated idea of the week was born in a Republican administration, the second came from Benson's boss, President Clinton, who last year told us confidently that the reason the bond market was soaring and long-term interest rates were tumbling was that the market was enthusiastically cheering what he called his deficit reduction program. Alas, it turns out that the president was ascribing far too complex motives to the simple-minded folks in the bond market. What they were really applauding, it is now increasingly evident, was their perception that the Clinton administration had managed to stop economic growth dead in its tracks. Now that we've had a couple of quarters of growth again, to the delight of just about everybody except a bond trader, long-term rates have not only rebounded, they're actually higher today than on the day Bill Clinton was inaugurated. For the reference of future presidents who are tempted to delve into Wall Street analysis, it's useful always to remember that the one thing that truly scares a bond market any time, any year, under any president is the terrible fear that someone somewhere may actually be getting a job. With friends like that, you don't need Congress. But the third and final discredited idea of the week came from a noted Republican. Reality may be merciless, but it is indisputably nonpartisan. And that was Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan who has spent the last three months unintentionally demonstrating the folly of the belief that if short-term rates go higher, long-term rates will go lower. That was the key idea behind this year's three increases in short-term rates, which the Fed controls, each of which was followed by a steep increase in long-term rates, which the Fed cannot control. And now traders are convinced that it's just a matter of time, less than three weeks being the most common guess, till the Fed has to increase short-term rates again, and possibly the discount rate too. What we're seeing is a great clash between serious economists, the best of whom have been unable to detect any inflationary pressures worthy of the name, and emotional traders who remember only that they haven't been hurt by selling bonds each time the Fed rushes in to help. 
Could it be that all the great minds in Washington might benefit by taking a week off and going back to the drawing board? We tonight will talk with the really serious money. Indeed, the biggest pile in America and the man who runs it. But first, let's see who was discrediting whom in Wall Street in the week just passed. And as the Dow Jones Industrial Average indicates, stocks began the week with their second best day of the year and managed to hold on, despite the continuing selling in the bond market, to end with a fairly sprightly bounce. The Dow picked up 33 points to close at 3681.69, more than regaining its losses of the two previous weeks. And most of the broader market indexes did even better than the Dow. There was no motion among our 10 chief elves, whose consensus verdict on where the Dow will be in six months is still a bearish minus four, if you take that technical stuff seriously. What seriously baffled the financial markets this week was whether the weaker than expected first quarter was simply a bad weather phenomenon, and whether the mild bounce in inflation then should outweigh the lowest year-to-year -year inflation increase in fully three decades. Meanwhile, the weakness in the dollar offered slight encouragement to precious metals traders. And if it all begins to seem like a bad science fiction movie to you, know that according to one report this week, a medium cup of buttered popcorn has more artery-clogging fat than a bacon and eggs breakfast, a Big Mac and fries lunch, and a steak dinner combined. Hot fudge Sunday, anybody? Frank Capiello, what diet would you recommend for investors now? A little austerity for the time being. Uh, the, uh, the correction is still underway, Lou. We're not out of the woods, but I'll bet that before this year's out, we'll see new highs in the Dow. What are the signs you're looking for to tell you that the correction is over? Well, we've got to make a, a smooth transition from interest rate-driven market to an earnings-driven market. And this transition is always very volatile and uh, very dangerous. But I would guess if we can only stabilize interest rates after this next Fed move, which you commented on and which I think is coming. I think the Fed is going to raise the Fed funds rate, the rate the banks borrow from each other, maybe another quarter point. Uh, they'll bring out the arsenal, one discount rate in Greece. And that should be it. Uh, the, the Fed's crazy, but that's what they're going to do. Well, is there some other Fed motive other than the one I ascribed to them? Well, I, I think the Fed uh, had two motives when they started, Lou. One was to unwind a lot of this bond speculation and a derivative driven, and they've done that. They've dampened the speculation. The second is uh, more curious. The Fed's position, as I understand it, is if you see inflation, it's too late. So before they see inflation, they're striking, which is sort of like uh, we're going to kill the enemy uh, before we see him. And uh, that's what they're doing. Or even before he does anything menacing. Yeah, before he even <laughs> pops up. I think the Fed's You think wrong. it'll come May 17th, which is the Open Market Committee meeting? Well, probably everyone is expecting it. They might be perverse and not do it, but somewhere in the next month or so, we'll get another kick up, and that should be the end of it. That should be the stabilization that'll allow the market to start being earnings-driven again. Alan Bond, you agree with that analysis? I do agree with it, Lou. I think that uh, we started to see the transition from a, a market that was driven by interest rates into one that's being driven by earnings. Now that the earnings season is, to the most part, for the most part, behind us, We've seen pretty good corporate earnings, and I think it's been a, a kind of market in which investors could get back to basics. You know what's going to happen with interest rates, and uh, just focus on stock selection. If the economy does slow later this year, as seems not improbable, and if, which would presumably reassure the bond market, will it worry the stock market? Will it hurt earnings enough to hurt stocks? I don't think it's going to worry the market enough. I think that uh, from a valuation standpoint, you have some attractive-looking industries and attractive stocks, even at this point. And if you focus on those kinds of companies, for example, a promise in the gaming industry, we have an industry that's going to grow by 100% over the next two years. You know, you, you just have great growth companies that are selling at below market multiples in many instances. The promise is strictly Mr. Bonds. Don Dessauer, what do you think? Well, I hate to say this, Lou, but on the <laughs> fundamental part of it, I, I'm in agreement, although I think this market could turn at any time because these uh, institutional investors have turned out to be quite unpredictable, always trying to anticipate one another. And they all think, I think, more or less the same way we do here right now, that the inflation is a ghost. There isn't any inflation. I even think inflation will be lower at the end of this year than it was in 1993. So we have a phenomenon here where the economy is growing and inflation is going down. That, that could be explosive. I don't know when the pros will turn bullish again, but when they do, I think this stock market will just gallop ahead 
so fast that if you don't buy on weakness, you won't have a chance to buy at all. So you think it's a sucker sell-off, trying to get the weak hands to sell now before they take the market up? I, I think it's a little bit of that because we've seen cases where you go in and try to buy stocks at the, at the price that's posted, and there's very little stock available. So I think the professional market makers, among others, have been scared, not knowing what the institutional crowd was going to do, kind of backed away and let this market alone. Well, when they all go back in, it's going to go up, I think, and go up very tidily and very quickly. All right. In any event, panelists, it is time now to ask, as Shakespeare might have, had he been a regular viewer, to buy or not to buy? That is the question, as we answer some viewer mail. Frank Capiello, here's a question that seems to flow right out of tonight's headlines. So how would you respond to Julian Ho of Vancouver, Canada, who writes me as follows? Currency traders have been buying up the Japanese yen recently in anticipation of what is called the Clinton administration's strong yen policy. Can you please explain what this strong yen policy is and how it can be implemented? I thought that central banks had not been effective in arbitrarily propping up, propping up a currency. Is this a case of the currency traders buddying up with rather than bullying against an administration? He's got it nearly right. Um, the strong yen policy is put the yen up, or talk it up, put the dollar down, and Japanese exports become more expensive, and that theoretically solves our trade deficit. Uh, it hasn't been working, but they, they keep at it. Uh, the way you do it is to have the Secretary of the Treasury and the Fed, as well as the President, talk about we need a stronger yen. And you have 200,000 currency speculators out there to take a look and say, well, the thing to do then is there's no support for the dollar. We'll buy the yen, sell the dollar, and have that nice, perfect transaction in between. And that's what's been going on. That's why the dollar gets so weak. Now, we did intervene today. The Fed did intervene today. But God knows what's going to happen in another two weeks. I thought you knew all that stuff. <laughs> right. Alan Bond, Bernard Roth of Ferndale, New York, wonders if you can solve a mystery for him. I've traded with four different major brokerage houses, he writes, and in each instance, when I requested their schedule used to compute brokerage commissions, I was informed that they are not permitted to supply me with one. Since discount brokers continually advertise their rates, contending they charge far less than so-called full-service full brokers, how can I make an intelligent comparison if I don't have the, quote, major, unquote, broker schedules? Are stock brokerage companies permitted to withhold their rate schedules from their customers? If not, how do I proceed to obtain them? Well, he has a very good point. In fact, the brokerage firms are not, or do not have to give him their rate schedules. And from a competitive standpoint, uh, the regulation agencies don't enforce that, that rule. Now, what he could do is to, if he wants to purchase securities, he could call those uh, various brokerage firms and ask them how much it will cost for him to purchase those number of shares. Uh, I would advise him to do that, and from a competitive standpoint, if he has a good relationship with a brokerage firm, maybe they'll uh, offer that schedule to him. John Dessau, Ray Hollinger of Westminster, Maryland, observes that since the 1970s, we've heard little about oil shortages. And he wonders whether they still exist, and if so, how they will affect oil stocks in the next five years. He's also curious about whether there are any American oil companies that would profit from an increase in the use of automobiles in China and India. Well, Lou, Mr. Hollinger is on to something. Today is much different from the 1970s, and oil is one of the areas in which the difference is very clear. We have a surplus of oil in world markets today, and still we haven't got a rack back in the oil markets, for example, and that's why oil prices have come down. But he's also on to the longer-term trend, because as economies of China, India, Latin America, and elsewhere improve, there will be increased demand for oil. That will restore the balance, and I think put the oil price up to the benefit of American oil companies. Exxon, for example, you probably could buy any American oil company today with a five-year point of view and do well. My favorite of all of them is USX Marathon, because that seems to be a little bit of a turnaround stock, and I think it will turn around. All righty. Now, if you would like to drill our panelists in the hope of pumping some profits, remember that our slogan around here is an optimistic, oil's well that ends well. So send your crudest underground questions to us here at Wall Street Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117, or fax them to us at 410-581-0980. Now, before we meet tonight's special guest, whose firm pioneered the concept of index funds more than 20 years ago, let's see how such funds have grown over time and why they appeal to many investors who figure, if you can't beat them, join them. The number one argument for investing in index funds is the poor record of so-called professional managers who are paid to beat the market. Indeed, in the past decade, fully two-thirds of all mutual funds have failed to keep up with the S&P 500. 
Not surprisingly, then, the assets placed in index funds have skyrocketed over the past 20 years at an annual growth rate of 34%. Index funds simply buy whatever is in a given stock index. Thus, give or take the occasional transaction cost when a substitution is made in the index, such funds should approximately match the performance of that index. Despite this assurance, however, most pension funds are still trying to beat the averages. Nearly $5 trillion was in U.S. pension funds at the end of 1993, but less than half a trillion was indexed. One problem is deciding exactly which index fund to invest in. While the S&P 500, with its heavy weighting of blue chip stocks, has been the traditional industry benchmark, some people might want instead to keep up with, say, a small stock index, or a Japanese stock index, or whatever. In fact, my guest firm alone has funds that track 111 different indexes. Is the index fund concept, which offers broad diversification, minimal transaction costs, and low management fees, for you? Or should you just give it your index finger? To keep our own finger on the pulse, let's go over now and meet tonight's special guest, Fred Grauer. Hello, Fred. We're ho so happy to have you here. Thank you, Lou. You're most welcome. Fred Grauer is the king of the indexes. The firm he heads, Wells Fargo Nico Investment Advisors, manages more than twice as much in index fund money as anybody else, some $120 billion. And with a total of $160 billion of other people's money at his disposal, he qualifies as America's biggest investor. Mr. Grauer is a native Canadian who became an American only four years ago. And continuing the international flavor to his background, his San Francisco firm is an affiliate of Wells Fargo and & Company and Japan's Nikko Securities Company. Fred, if an index fund is such a no-brainer idea, why should anyone use you instead of, say, an index fund offered by a mutual fund family? There are significant economies of scale in the index business in order to get very low cost for the investors. In order to deliver the low execution cost, to deliver the low fees, you have to be big. You have f about 40 billion you don't index. Why? Well, it's active management. And active and passive management are really quite complementary. Index funds rely on the proposition that market prices are fair. They only get to be fair if you have strong active managers. We're also a strong active manager. You mean the active managers make the market and then the index funds take advantage of the market? That's correct. Why do you think the index funds have not grown more rapidly? Why is it still less than a tenth of the total business? Well, in a way, it's hope lives eternal. Uh, I think uh, it's a classic that uh, fear and greed rule markets and there is the expectation of being able to dominate markets. It is, however, uh, something of a theorem. Uh, Bill Sharp, Nobel laureate, has put it forth uh, several times that active managers, on average, will underperform markets by the cost of active management. Virtually everybody in the top ranks of the investment business, including three people here tonight, believe that they are able to beat the market. Some people do beat the market, some with some consistency. How do you explain that? Well, there are effective act active managers in the world. The challenge, of course, is identifying them. And the active manager's challenge is staying dominant. Do you and your personal investing just index? I put all of my uh, pension money uh, in asset allocation, which is a strategy that is active in nature, but uses index funds uh, to represent the markets. You have segued nicely into your new product, the Life Path. Why don't you explain that? Well, Life Path is an interesting solution to a problem that I think all of us face, whether we're institutional managers or uh, individuals. And that is, how do you choose uh, your investments? What kind of structure do you put in place? Life Path is a uh, product designed for the rest of your life, if you like. It's life cycle planning. It changes its risk exposure as people age it. Uh, it provides broad diversification across quite a range of different asset classes, domestic, international, stocks, bonds. And it responds actively to uh, changing risk premia between uh, different markets. You think then the basic decision is at what stage of your life do you have what percent, say in stocks, say in bonds, say in cash? That's right. However, in this product, 
It makes that decision for you. I never make decisions for our panelists. Let's bring them in, starting with Frank Capiello. Thank you, Luke. How does uh, an individual that has fifty or hundred thousand dollars, it's not a big institutional pension client, how does he take advantage of this indexing if he wanted to be indexed? Where would he go? Would he go to you as a bank? Would he go to a mutual fund? Well, he has several choices in the marketplace. I think the basic challenge for the individual investor who has that kind of money is to get the right asset allocation in the first place. Thus, products like Life Path or tactical asset allocation are good products. They provide a diversification across many markets. If the individual wants to uh, make that decision himself, then uh, using the index fund building blocks is quite acceptable. They can get them from uh, a Wells Fargo bank or uh, a number of mutual fund companies. Fred, the recent volatility in the stock market has scared away some individual investors. For the individuals who are out there thinking about putting money into the stock market right now, but have read a lot about program trading and how that has led to some of that volatility, with a firm the size of yours, I would imagine that, that program trading is something that you have to do to some extent. Well, how do you do that, and, and what do you think it's, what kind of effect has it had on the market? Program trading is a tool. It's an investment tool. It's, in itself, it does not create volatility. It's the uh, investment decision that lies behind uh, the use of the tool that may or may not create volatility. A program trade is a trade in a list of stocks. Uh, it can be, as the New York Stock Exchange defines it, 15 stocks or more. Uh, it was invented some 25 years ago at Wells Fargo Bank uh, as a way of buying uh, the stocks that make up uh, the index all at one time. It's a coordination device. It's nothing more than that. Fred, there are a lot of us, and I think I'm not the only one, uh, who really enjoy investing in individual stocks because we have a feeling we're participating in an individual business. Within your framework of indexation and life path, is there room for this kind of investing in an individual's uh, planning as well? Indeed. I think uh, approach to this kind of issue is to think of a core investment which could be a product like Life Path that provides broad diversification, that provides the uh, cornerstone of risk control around which the non-core can be arranged and that uh, affords the opportunity to make those individual security selections. But first, you have to get your risk under control. Fred, I want to go back to what Alan said about program trading. Not everybody may practice it in the same statesman-like way you've just described. Many market observers think it has contributed tremendously to market volatility, particularly on the downside. It certainly scares millions of individual investors around the country. Does any of the program trading concern you? Not really. The program trading that is occurring today is now measured very carefully by the New York Stock Exchange. Last week, for example, it amounted to some 160,000 shares for the week, uh, approximately 10% of the total volume of the New York Stock Exchange. The composition of that program trading is uh, primarily broker-based. Uh, that is, brokers trading for their own account, about 60%. The other 40% coming uh, from customers like ourselves. Uh, it is utilized for a number of different investment strategies. Some investment strategies can be volatility-creating. There's no question about that. But a great majority of uh, the applications don't create uh, volatility. We're nearly out of ta time. Is there ever going to be a time when individual investors can participate in program trading, say, through a fund? They do. Uh, the reality for most investors today uh, is that they have institutionalized their investing. They've gone to mutual funds. They've gone to 401ks, to IRAs. To the extent that any index funds are being used, program trading is being used. This program is fully traded for tonight. Thank you very much, Fred. Thanks very much, panelists. I hope you'll be back with us again next week. Then we'll look beyond the headlines for what's really ahead for this economy in the company of the man who, for 14 years running, has been voted the best economist in Wall Street. He's Ed Hyman, and his visits here over the years have made it clear to our viewers why he has earned such respect. Meanwhile, this has been Wall Street Week. I'm Louis Rukeyser. Good night. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. 
is a production of Maryland Public Television, made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the annual financial support from viewers like you, by the Travelers Insurance Companies, providing American business with insurance, financial services, and managed health care, the Travelers Insurance Companies, by MFS, MFS helping mutual fund and institutional investors achieve their financial goals since 1924 and by Prudential Securities. With more than 5,600 financial advisors nationwide, Prudential Securities can help you invest your money wisely. For a printed transcript of this program, send $5 to Transcripts. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Transcripts are also available to subscribers of the Dow Jones News Retrieval Service. Street Week with Louis Rukeyser is produced by Maryland Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. This is PBS. There are times when you think it's all going wrong. You struggle to make dreams come true. Still loving the answer. get the results on your French test today, Zach? What? Zach, try to follow me. This is English, your native tongue. <laughs> How did you do on the French test? Nice jacket, Mr. C. I've noticed a lot of journalists like yourself seem to favor the safari look. Is it practical or just a fashion statement? <laughs> Think about it. Come on, Zach. Hey, hey, I'm waiting, Zach. Hey, Mr. C. Hey, what do you say, guys? You know, I like your sweater, Mr. C. I've noticed a lot of older men seem to favor cardigans instead of pullovers. Is that because as you age, it's harder getting the sweater over the head? Or is it like a hair thing? <laughs> what did you get on the test, Zach? 18. Out of 100? <laughs> I tried hard, Dad. I swear I did my best. I just don't have an ear for languages. Zach, I know you tried. That's why it's time to get help. Oh, come on, Dad. Not a tutor. It's not fair. I shouldn't have to take French in school, then come home and have some geek tutor teach it to me all over again. That was our deal, pal. You had your chance and you blew it. Now, I'm going to call the school to recommend a tutor. End of discussion. How do you say this really stinks in French? If you knew that, you wouldn't be getting a tutor. I am. Um, how's your day? Wonderful. Just the most wonderful day. Notice anything different about me? Ah, uh, you got your hair done? It's very attractive. No, I'll give you a hint. And the same to you. I'm professionally clean today. Oh, and I didn't notice. I'm a lout. Guess how the jeweler cleaned the stone. I have no idea. Windex. You know what Windex cleans? Glass. The ring is glass, Walter. <laughs> Glass? Well, obviously, the jeweler made a mistake. There are seven jewelers in the mall. They all made the same mistake. Without a ring, a hand's not much to look at, is it? It's this funny-looking thing you grab a sandwich with. I bought this ring from old man Bleeker. He said it was almost a full carrot, and it only had one flaw. Well, now we know what the flaw is. <laughs> I'm sorry, Emily. You're telling the truth. You didn't know, did you? Walter, I apologize. I should never have accused you of being deceitful. You were just a fool. You're right. I was a fool. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You thought the ring was real, and that's real enough for me. Don't touch that ring. I'm buying you a new ring. 
Oh, Walter, that's so sweet, but I don't need another ring. My mind's made up. Walter, we're on a fixed income. We can't afford something so wonderful as a genuine diamond ring just for me. <laughs> then I'll get a job. Don't be silly. A job at your... <laughs> Go ahead, say it. Height. <laughs> you were going to say age, weren't you? You think I'm too old, Emily? Listen, I'm a salesman. As long as I can talk, I can work. Now, I'm going to get a job, and you're going to get a new diamond ring. And somewhere in here, there is a job, and it's got my name on it, and there it is. Salesman wanted. Ed, how the hell with you? Why? What was wrong? It's for a diamond salesman. Why are you mad at me? Is it my fault you stink at French and I happen to be gifted? I tutor you myself, but why should we both suffer? <laughs> Hi. Hello. Are you Zach? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Shelly Peters. I guess I'm here to help you in French. Hi, I'm Zach. You'll be tutoring me. I was just kidding. Je m'appelle Hartley. Comment allez-vous? Ah, très bien, merci. You're very good. I see you don't need any help from me. Well, actually... That's right. He's gifted. <laughs> Hi. You're Zach's tutor, Shelly, right? Yes. Well, you've got your work cut out for you. Guess we better get to it. Should we go to your room, Zach? <laughs> sure. Follow me. Shelly, it's upstairs, the second room on the right. I'll be right there. Okay. What's wrong? Nothing. It's just that Shelly Peters. She's the cutest girl in the eighth grade. So? So? I just wanted you to know that I'll never question one of your decisions again, Dad. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> How'd your interviews go today, Pop? Oh, great. No offers yet. A couple of people expressed interest. One guy said, how do you feel? And the other guy said, would you like to lie down? I'm really sorry. Yeah, that's what the third guy said. <laughs> Pop, let me give you the money for the ring. Oh, thanks. You want to drop it in my tin cup, or would you like to poke my eye out? <laughs> All I'm saying is that... All you you're have... saying is, you don't think I can cut it either. Well, I got news for you. I've got another interview coming up, and I'm going to show you where you're wrong. You know, Pop, I think you're going to come through. You've got the look. What look is that? The last time I saw the look must have been just before you retired. You were going through a dry spell. Oh, I remember that. I couldn't make a sale to save my life. Until the day you came downstairs ready to go on a road trip. Your shoes were shined, you had a new tie, and you had the look. The look that said, I'm not going to give up. The look that said, nobody's going to say no to me today. Never forgot that look. Yeah, that was a hell of a trip. I sold everything in the car. I sold the car. <laughs> <laughs> Think I still got the look, huh? Yeah, same look. Yeah. Same tie. Yeah. And some of the hair. <laughs> Go get them, Pop. Now, how do you say you have the pen? Tu a uh, l'estilo. Very good. Except you use the word tu for you. What's wrong with that? You should use the word vu. See, always use vu instead of tu unless dealing with family members or attempting to convey a feeling of intimacy with a loved one. Oh, sorry. I thought the lesson was over at four. I'll come back later. Oh, boy, 20 after four. I gotta run. See you later, Zach. So long, Hartley. Bye. <laughs> Do you smell that? Hey, don't look at me. You know the rule. Whoever smelt it, dealt it. <laughs> no. That wonderful scent. Don't you smell it? Yeah, nice perfume. That's not perfume. You can't buy that in a store. That's her. Oh, Hartley, she's incredible. What am I going to do? About what? You've got the girl of your dreams coming to your room twice a week. You've got a maid. I've got nothing. She's 13 and I'm 11. So what? You never heard of a May December kind of a thing? <laughs> Besides, I saw her looking at you. She was plenty interested. There were signs. What signs? She was on your bed, wasn't she? Oh, come on. We were just studying and stuff. What stuff? Well, you know, just regular talking and laughing stuff. The two of you were laughing? A little, so what? 
She's not paid to laugh. <laughs> and I don't know how to break it to you, but you're not that funny. Thanks. I think we're on to something here. Now for the key question. Was there any touching? <laughs> touching? Are you crazy? Okay, so maybe we kind of brushed hands and we turned the page at the same time. But that was a mistake. She doesn't make mistakes. She's a professional. <laughs> She's giving you signals. A laugh, a touch, an extra 20 minutes on the clock. What do you want her to do? Stick her tongue in your mouth? <laughs> You're so far off the mark. It isn't funny. Hi again. I forgot my books. Oh, yeah. Here. Sorry. Oh, that's okay, Shelly. Hey, Zach, I have this idea. There's a cute little French movie playing downtown. Would you like to see it with me next Saturday afternoon? We could help with your pronunciation. <laughs> a movie? Sure. Great. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. I've got a date with Shelly Peters. <laughs> I've never hated you as much as I do at this moment. <laughs> Ma. Matt, the family is being destroyed. Everything that was good is coming to an end. We shall never be the same again. I see. So what's for dinner? <laughs> I'm serious. Your father is killing himself with his insane quest for a job. Well, it's gone way past a new ring. Now it's pride and stubbornness. He's out there in a cold, cruel world that doesn't want him anymore. He's headed for heartbreak and tragedy. Well, I got a job. Is there ever any doubt? <laughs> Way to go, Pop. What are you selling? Doorknobs, brass, silver, wood. Nothing fancy, but there's no travel. I sell the hardware stores here in town, just what the doctor ordered. Oh, <clears throat> I just think it's the most wonderful thing that you got a job. Now, could you do me one favor? What? Quit. <laughs> Quit? You proved yourself you could get a job. That's what's really important. Emily, I want this job, and I'm not quitting until you get a new diamond ring on your finger. Now, get ready. I'm taking everybody out to dinner. But I've already made dinner. My famous Swedish vegetarian meatballs. Those meatballs. Oh, I got an idea. Leave them out till tomorrow. I'll sell them as doorknobs. <laughs> Advice, Hartley. But you haven't heard my armrest theory yet. Pronunciation, or do you want to make out? <laughs> what do you know about making out? You've never been on a date in your life. Yeah, but I've watched my brother go through puberty. We're in for some weird stuff. <laughs> All right, armrest theory. Make it quick. All right, come over here. What? What? Sit down. Now, this is the armrest of the movie seat, do. You put your arm on the armrest, too. Go ahead. But there's no room. She has her arm on there. That's the point. Now put your arm next to mine. See? They're touching. Now this is the moment of truth. If she keeps her arm there, touching yours, she's giving you a message. She wants you to make the next move. What if she takes her arm away? Then all bets are off and you're just a pathetic little kid doing homework with his tutor. I'll walk you through everything. You take her hand and you say something to her. Like what? Well, not much. Something simple, but flattery. Like, you know you're very pretty, don't you? And then she'll say something like, thanks. But she's looking at you, right? So? So now it's showtime. You kiss her. <laughs> then what? Hey, my brother and I can only take you so far. Saturday afternoon. I told you, it's the best time to meet new clients because it's a much more relaxed atmosphere. Walter? Mm. You are keeping the strangest hours. Is there something about this job you're not telling me? Something you don't want me to know? <sighs> All right. I didn't want to tell you before, Emily, but I've been recruited by the CIA. <laughs> I'm infiltrating the doorknob industry. <laughs> My code name is Knocker, and I'm very dangerous. <laughs> now, goodbye, and don't worry. Are you trying not to look at the subtitles? I'm trying. Can you follow what's going on? I think so. He wants her to rob a bank with him. Close. They're just going to visit her mother in the hospital. Il les sert. 
Oh, that's so gross. Oh, I know. I was just kidding. Did you see that? He doesn't even know he's eating that bug. Oh, gross. Very gross. Shelly, you know, you Zach, worry. I've got a great idea. We make believe we're in France. From now on, when we want to talk, we have to talk only French. But I just wanted to Zach. tell you... En Francais. You can do it. You're really a much better student than you think. Come on, try. <laughs> Shelly, vous êtes un... Très... Um, très... Play what, Zach? Play this. <laughs> Zach, what are you doing? I'm sorry, Shelly. So am I. Yeah, how was a French movie? It was bien. Play damn bien. That's how it was. Whoa! Just hold on there. What's the matter? I don't want to talk about it, Dad. I just want to go to my room. Zach, just tell me. I'm begging you. Just let me go. I can't talk now. Okay. But whatever it is, when you're ready to talk, I'll be here. I made an animal of myself in the movie. I kissed Shelly and she ran out. Now she hates me. You out my room or anything? <laughs> Zach, I know you're embarrassed, but it's not that bad. You weren't an animal. You weren't there. You didn't see the look on her face after I kissed her. The look that said, yuck. Believe me, I've gotten that look from plenty of women. <laughs> Zach, I know it hurts, but it comes with the territory. If I told you some of the dumb stuff I did when I was your age... Dad, please, not another one of your stories. <laughs> Heather, the boom day I see her standing at the bus stop. So I figured it's now or never. Besides, I was wearing a new pair of sunglasses, and I looked very, very cool. Dad, get to the embarrassing part. You're losing me. So I walk up, I say, hi. And she looks at me and smiles. <laughs> I smiled back and she said, your sunglasses. I said, they're new, you like them? And she said, yes, but one of your lenses is out. <laughs> that of myself. <laughs> That's it? The sunglasses thing? That's all you have for me? Unbelievable, my life is over. One of your lenses fell out? I come to you for help and you give me sunglasses. And what kind of name is Heather de Blasio anyway? <laughs> Um, don't make a sound. How do you know she won't show? Because A, you think she's gonna show, and B, you're an idiot. Yeah. My God, she's here. I told you. Now here's how you handle it. Hartley, get out of here. Fine, I have other clients. <laughs> Come in. Shelly, I didn't think... It's it... Tuesday, it's my job, so let's just do it. Goodbye, Hartley. Burr. Shelly, I'm really sorry. The lesson, Zach. No talk, no anything. You there, me here, just the lesson. Page 27, conjugate the verb to be. Yeah, okay. Je suis tu es. Shelly, I didn't mean to kiss you. I mean, I didn't mean to, but I couldn't help myself because you're so pretty and you smell so good. And Hartley's armrest theory did seem to be panning out, so I did. I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. Zach. What you did was pretty lame. Just not like that. Oh, no, of course not. Maybe if you're a little older, who knows? But a couple of years make a big difference. You're just a kid. Thanks. <laughs> I feel a lot better. <laughs> but you sure kiss like you're older. You don't mean that. Do you mean that? <laughs> oh, yeah. You've had lots of experience, haven't you? Well, sure. <laughs> well, not lots to work. Okay. I want you to conjugate the verb to be again, but let's look at it first. Shelly, I've got to say this. Those words weren't his. That armrest thing wasn't his. Even the kiss wasn't his. All right, so the lips were his, but it was my concept. <laughs> my phone number's 555-5929. Find out why they call me the love tutor. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Collins. You're calling from the... Har who? Harbor Duchess Tours? No, I don't know a social security number. There must be some mistake. 
My Walter Collins is a salesman. No, he's not on a boat. What in the world would my husband be doing on a boat? And so, land lovers, this has come. Our apologies for the fog, but fortunately for us, our city is just as beautiful to hear as it is to see. Be sure and check under your seats for your personal belongings who disembark from the aft gangway. May I add that this voyage has been one of the highlights of my many years on the open seas. If you've been on the open seas so much, how come you spent half the trip in the john? Because sailing, sailing. Oh, madam, the tour is over. Hello, sailor. How long are you in port? <laughs> Emily, what are you doing here? I was lonely. I thought I'd take a cruise and meet a seafaring man. You've been here the whole time? Walter, why didn't you tell me? I didn't tell you because I knew you'd give me a hard time. You hate water. You hate boats. You got nauseous watching the Poseidon adventure. Good job, okay? You imagine that? Oh, Walter, I'm so sorry. I quit working because I didn't want to work anymore, not because I couldn't. I remember the company begged you to stay. You're damn right they did, and I still got what it takes. And nobody is sweeping Walter Collins under the rug. If I can't be a salesman, I'll be a tour guide. Or I'll be a rag picker. Whatever, I'll be good at it. Oh, Walter, my little nautical nut. <laughs> You're a wonderful man. Oh, well, in that case, I guess you won't want this. Give me that rock. <laughs> you really like it? I love it. But how'd you get the money so fast? You haven't been working that long. I knocked off a jewelry store. What do you think? I bought it on credit. Come on. Walter. Hey, I'll work here a few more weeks and pay it off. It's no big deal. Come on, let's go home. Are we shrouded in fog? Mmm, salt. I like a salty man. Come on, let's go. Remember what we did on that last boat trip we took together? Oh, yeah. They caught us and kicked us off before we even got to Staten Island. Well, there's nobody here to catch us now. Come here, Commodore. Let me show you how to make Admiral. <laughs> Coming up next, it's an all-new Empty Nest. And Sunday night, it's a country and comedy spectacular on Hot and Home Improvement's Tim Allen. Hot Country Nights, Sunday at 8, 7 Central on NBC.